hear about you as well. Yeah, thanks, Harpreet. Hi, everyone, and welcome to RAG with Lama2 and Langchain, building with open source LLM ops. My name is Greg Lochnane, and I'm the founder and CEO of AI Makerspace, an online community that's accelerating learning for data scientists and machine learning engineers like you who want to build production grade LLM applications. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for this event. As Harpreet mentioned, we'd love to, for you to share in the chat where you're joining from today. Our community is global and we know Harpreet is as well. During today's event, you'll learn about the mysterious RAG or retrieval augmented generation that the entire Gen AI world is talking about right now. We'll break down how Langchain fits into this picture, as well as how to power the whole system with the best open source LLM out there today, Llama 2. If you hear anything during today's event that prompts a question, please follow the Slido link in the description box on the YouTube page. We'll do our best to answer the most upvoted questions during the Q&A portion of today's event. With that, I'm pumped to welcome my good friend and colleague, LLM wizard, Chris Alexiak, to the stage today, as we'll be working as a team to deliver this concept plus code lesson. Chris is the head of LLMs at AI Makerspace. He's an experienced online instructor, curriculum developer, and YouTube creator always learning, building, shipping, and sharing like a legend. Chris, you ready to rock and rag today, man? You know it's rag time, Greg, you know? <laughs> rag time it is, man. I can't wait to get this going today. We are going to go ahead and kick it off right now. All right. So, So uh, thanks, Chris. We'll have you back in just a minute as we kick off the demo portion of today's event. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with like, what is RAG anyways? We're going to talk about the Barbenheimer RAG system that we built for this special event today. And we're going to talk about, well, how does Langchain exactly fit in to the RAG system? We can build this thing out in three easy pieces as we'll walk through with Chris, and then we'll finally have conclusions in QA run by Harpreet at the end. All right, so RAG, uh, everybody's talking about it. Like, what's the deal? Well, when you ask LLMs questions, sometimes they do this weird thing and they actually hallucinate. They make stuff up. This is kind of a problem because we want to be able to leverage AI in ways that we can rely on. And a lot of times when we're getting terrible answers or made up answers, we can't rely on them. We need a way to fact check LLMs. And this is sort of the baseline idea behind RAG. It's how can we use this retrieval augmented question answering approach rather than just a simple question answer approach that might result in a hallucination. And it's very simple. We're looking up more information and sources so we can put those in the answer. So what does this look like exactly? I mean, the retrieval augmented generation, where does this name come from? Well, the retrieval piece is referring to this idea of a retriever, which is an interface that returns documents in any given query context. So you're essentially creating a way to find that relevant information. That's the retriever. It's returning relevant info. The augmented piece is talking about augmenting your prompt or your input to the LLM to provide that additional context that's been retrieved from your source documents. Okay, so the generation, of course, is just generative. And, you know, if you're into this space at all, no really further explanation necessary there. So let's walk through piece by piece what this RAG system looks like. But first, let's understand the limitations of dealing with 
the LLM to answer some of the questions we're going to pose to our RAG system. For instance, if we ask about Ryan Gosling and Barbie, it's not going to be able to answer if we ask, say, for instance, ChatGPT. It doesn't have the data. It was only trained on data up till 2021. Of course, we can Google the answer. We can find out some information about how his performance was. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. But can we do more complex things? Can we ask it questions like, did these movies explore themes that are similar or what sort of themes were in these movies? We could ask about, for instance, existentialism. And we can straight up ask, did these movies explore themes in a RAG system? But in a regular LLM, in a chat GPT context, what we're forced to deal with is we're forced to deal with you know, giving it more information, sort of having a chat with it. And then even though the program admits that it really doesn't know the answer, it's going to go ahead and offer some guesses, some, you might call them hallucinations, but they're not bad. Uh, you know, Barbie films generally have that individualism vibe, talking about friendship and courage and self-discovery. So probably Oppenheimer is more likely to have existentialist vibes. So that's pretty cool. And, you know, I think as we think about how we can take this to the next level, that's when we need to think about RAG. When we think about fact-checking a question like this. So we're not going to use just a simple LLM. Instead, we're going to build out a system. So what does it look like? Well, the first thing that we do is we take our query and we take the words in our query and through an embedding process, we turn those words into numbers. And what we can do is we can compare those numbers, the vector, representation of our query to all the reviews that we've taken from IMDB about Barbie and turned into vectors. And we can look and see how similar is the vector query to vectors in our Barbie database that we've created, in our Barbie vector database that we've created. We can do something similar with, you know, for instance, asking about Cillian Murphy in Oppenheimer. And perhaps most interestingly, we can ask questions like, did these movies explore a common theme by putting both of these in the same vector database? And this is what we're going to do today. Note here, there is no LLM in this image. There is simply an embedding model. So this is doing a lot of the work of the system that we're going to be building today. So what comes next? Well, in order to build the embedding model, we have to, with, in order to create the embeddings, we need to choose an embedding model. And we choose one today. You can see here, you can find it on the massive text embedding benchmark um, on Hugging Face. It's the Mini LM L6 V2. Um, check it out on the leaderboard. Additionally, we need to choose a vector database. Well, we're gonna choose FACE, Facebook AI Similarity Search. Note that Facebook AI Similarity Search came out in 2017, and that's why it's called Facebook and not Meta AI Similarity Search. This is something that they've been working on for a long time. It's, it's now a vector database option that's really simple to get up and running. It's completely open source. It works very, very fast to find similar vectors within a database. And it's just overall like a really powerful tool to pick up and start learning about this kind of system with. There's some additional information shown here if you're a JavaScript developer about why you might want to choose face over other vector DBs, but that's sort of a topic that is for another day. For today, we're just going to roll with face and um, you know build out the rack. But there are a lot of different embedding models, a lot of different vector databases we could use in any given rag system. What comes next is we're going to take our user query and we're going to add some context to it. 
so that we augment our prompt using this prompt template setup and then feed that in to our model. The model that we're using today is of course Llama 2. It's the most popular model out there and it's because it's crushing it uh, against pretty much all the benchmarks. So if you look at the open LLM leaderboard on Hugging Face today, you'll see Llama 2 is basically dominating the top LLMs out there. They're fine tuned in different ways, but at the core, they're all sort of using Llama 2. All right, so from this step right here, you might ask, well, how do we actually get the context? And this is where we are searching the vector database, we're finding any relevant sources, and we're providing that information in such a way that we're augmenting the prompt with context. So the, key, the query goes in, we're looking for similar things, we're augmenting our initial query, and then only then are we feeding it into the LLM. And of course, once we feed it into the LLM, in, out, we get our answer. Okay, so this is the basic RAG system broken down step by step. So what exactly is LangChain doing then? Well, remember the purpose of LangChain is to build more complex LLM applications, to make LLMs more powerful than they are alone. And we just saw, you know, we didn't even touch the LLM until the very last piece. The power really came in building out the vector DB, allowing us to augment the prompt that goes into the LLM. So this is sort of the key of LangChain. And the key abstraction is the chain itself. It's just allowing us to connect stuff to other stuff. So there's lots of code that you'll see today that leverages tools from LangChain. This is a framework full of, you know, ways to easily connect into tools like Face and like Hugging Face and embeddings and LLMs and, and all of it. And this is an example of just the chain we used for the vector store, also called a data indexing chain. But all of the chaining is happening sort of all around. We're using LangChain pretty much everywhere in this system. So this is, why LangChain is so fundamental to the system that you're gonna to see today. So let's break it down. We're gonna do three easy pieces today for this Barbenheimer index. Number one is we're gonna do an IMDB data preparation step. Number two, we're gonna create our index. And number three, we're gonna build out the retrieval chain. This is really the workhorse that really makes it happen at the end. So step one, is pretty simple. You have to do it any project you're doing in machine learning, data preparation. So we're gonna get the data from IMDB. We're gonna go ahead and load our CSV file of our scraped data in. We're gonna parse through it. And then we're gonna chunk our text into documents. This is sort of documents in the natural language processing um, terminology, not sort of they're full documents, okay? So it could be any length of text. Chris will talk about details of the chunks in the code in just a second. And then task two is gonna be creating that index from the chunked documents. So we are selecting a vector store, in this case, face. We're creating those embeddings using the chosen embedding model. And we're also setting up an embedding cache, which is a really important thing to do if you're gonna ask similar questions many times. Chris will talk more about the embedding cache as we see step-by-step step in detail in code, how to set up our index right now. Chris, take it away. Thanks, Greg. So yeah, the idea is that we have this system we want to build and it depends on a couple pieces. Uh, as Greg was describing to us, we have our retrieval system and then we have our LLM. Um, you know, and we are retrieving pieces of context to help augment our LLM's uh, outputs. And so the first thing we have to do is build that retrieval system. This is going to be the place where you spend most of your time, a lot of the time that you're building retrieval systems. When you see headlines coming out every day, they're usually talking about how they've made a retrieval system better and better. Uh, we're going to go through a very uh, simplified example today so that we can see at its core how it's working. Um, but this is the place where you're going to have the, the most engineering hours spent for sure. 
Because we're going to be using Langchain and Llama 2 today, we do need to get some prerequisites. Um, that's it. So there you go. When we go to the uh, data preparation, we're just going to fetch some pre-built CSVs. If you really want the scraping code, you know, we can pass it along, but it's just scraping from IMDB reviews. Uh, we have a couple CSVs that help us outline what the uh, reviews are, you know, who made them, everything like this. Uh, once we collect those CSVs, we have to turn them into a format that makes sense. Uh, you know, uh, just feeding a table to an LLM is probably not going to be the most fun time. Uh, you definitely can, but uh, we're going to convert those CSV files to, to text. You could use things that query these CSV files uh, and produce kind of, you know, like aggregate results or statistics. But for this example, we're just going to parse these CSVs into text. Uh, we're going to do that using the Langchain CSV loader. We're also going to uh, keep track of our source column, which is our review URL. So review URL is the, the big kind of benefit here. Uh, this is going to let us source what reviews we use to make our determination. As Greg was saying, there's a lot of issues with hallucination in LLMs, and this is going to be helpful for us. Because we're using the CSV loader, all we have to do is tell Langchain where the CSV is, and then we can load it up. You can see that we, we have 125 documents from our Barbie data, and then we have 150 documents from our Oppenheimer data. Now that we have our review information, we are going to need to split it up a little bit, right? So the reasons we want to chunk it is to kind of, you know, unpack this data into the smallest useful bits of information. Those useful bits of information are what we're going to pass to the LLM as context after we've retrieved them based on a user's query. We're going to use just some very straightforward uh, recursive character text splitting here. We're going to use a chunk size of 1,000. We're going to use a chunk overlap of 100. And we're going to use the length function. Uh, you know, this is where you're going to spend a lot of time. So the way you chunk your data is very important. And it is very impactful to the final result. So in this example, we're just kind of choosing it to showcase the, the fact that we want to chunk. Uh, but this is where you're going to spend a lot of time whenever you're developing these things uh, for, for real. Uh, we're also using the length function. Uh, the kind of wisdom we're relying on is that a character is going to be less than a token. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we set our recursive character uh, text splitter to chunk uh, documents of a thousand, a thousand characters is probably not going to be a thousand tokens. And so that's the, the wisdom we're using. Uh, we do have to work around our model's input window so that can uh, directly impact the size of chunks you want to use and the amount of chunks you want to use, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, in a second. But the idea is most of these reviews aren't very long, and so we're not going to chunk a lot of them. As you can see, our documents don't grow too much. Uh, we, we add about 30 to 50 uh, you know, documents, so most of these reviews are short and fit well within the 1,000 character limit. We're just going to add these together. There is a number of things that we could do uh, if we wanted to build a more complex system. We could uh, build two different uh, indices and then uh, dynamically decide which we want to use through a router or through an agent or through any number of things. Uh, but for this example, we just want to showcase the fact that uh, even when all of these pieces of context are jumbled into the same box, uh, our model is able to, to correctly suss out uh, what feedback is relevant and what is not. Now that we have all these chunks or documents in the NLP sense, uh, we need to turn them into something useful, right? Like uh, text is great, but we can't really search through text quickly or efficiently. So we're going to go ahead and uh, use a vector store. Now, the idea is, as Greg was talking about, we're going to convert all of these little chunks of text or documents into a vector embedding representation. So we're going to turn them into a, a sequence of numbers, and that's going to help us compare uh, what, what documents are closest very quickly. We're going to also be leveraging face, uh, as, as we've already discussed. It's fantastic. It works, and it's straightforward to implement. 
We are going to also be using cached backed embeddings, right? The idea is that uh, if our users are going to be sending us the same, you know, the same text over and over again, we don't want to have to like re embed it over and over again, right? So in this example, we're just talking about a few, maybe a few seconds or some GPU time, but uh, especially if you're using like a third party embedding service like OpenAI, you're, if you, if you have to pay every time someone asks the same question, then you're paying too much. Um, but we're going to be leveraging, as Greg mentioned, the sentence transformers, all mini LM, L6, V2. You, there's a whole zoo of these that you can pick. Uh, there's a leaderboard for them. And the idea is it's straightforward to implement whichever you, you decide. Uh, we're going to need to first create our hugging face embeddings, which is based on that sentence transformer uh, embedding model. And then we're going to wrap that in our cache backed embeddings, uh, which is going to be what lets us you know, hit the cache first, check to see if we've already embedded this query. If we have return the embeddings, if we haven't go straight to the embedding model. Uh, and from there we can build our face vector store from our documents and using our embedder. Now that we have our vector store, we're going to go ahead and see it working. Uh, this is going to be the explicit flow that needs to happen, but uh, we will abstract this away once we get to our retrieval chain. The basic idea here is straightforward. How is Will Ferrell in this movie? Uh, you know, that's our text, but text isn't what we need. We need numbers, right? We need a vector. So we're going to embed our query uh, using, our, uh, using our core embeddings model. So this is going to say, how is Will Ferrell in this movie? It's gonna convert it to a sequence of numbers. And then we're going to use similarity search by vector with that particular vectorized query and we're going to retrieve the top K documents. So what this means is we will turn our text into a vector. We're going to use the same embedding model that we used to originally embed uh, our, our vector store. Uh, this is necessary so that we're able to accurately find relevant or similar documents. And then we're going to do a, 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 a K nearest neighbors style uh, search, you know, uh, through face, it's, it's more complex than that, but the idea is it's going to retrieve the K4 closest, um, you know, documents. And you can see that we get, you know, these four documents in return, and we see things that are related to, uh, you know, Will Ferrell, Will Ferrell. So the idea is that we are able to retrieve relevant pieces of documents using our retriever system, uh, which is what we want to be able to do. Now the cached backed embeddings pattern, why do we care? Well, we care because we go from 13.4 milliseconds per, uh, per uh, to do the first set of our embeddings, right? So uh, over 10 milliseconds. And then with uh, the cached backed embeddings, we're able to uh, get that all the way down to 8.16 milliseconds per loop, which is huge. Uh, the idea here being that we, uh, we're we saving time every time we re-query our system. Um, and that is that for our uh, building our index, and we'll pass it back to Greg. Sweet, thanks, Chris. Uh, so setting up the index, pretty straightforward after we get the data in a row, in a row there. And what we're gonna do next is we're just gonna sort of bring this whole thing together. This is where we put the retrieve in retrieval augmented generation. We're actually putting the retrieval and the augmented in right now as we put this chain together. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take the LLM, the Llama 2 LLM, and we're gonna make it small, but still super useful. So we're able to run this 13 billion parameter model on some pretty modest hardware. Chris will talk about this in more detail in just a moment, but very, very cool that we can do stuff like this today. Um, it never ceases to amaze us every time we put some of this together. And then we're gonna be able to retrieve our answers about context. We're gonna be able to put them into the prompt and augment the prompt. And we're gonna then be able to sort of interact with our entire QA with sources chain that essentially makes up our RAG system. So what does this look like? Well, it looks like, you know, kind of this setup we saw early on where we're focused 
not on the LLM, but we're focused on setting up our vector store, our index, and we're focused on looking for similarity to the query that we provide. And what we're doing in this last piece is we're adding in that LLM and we're also adding in the retrieval of the context and putting that context into the prompt before we feed it into the LLM to get our final output. So these are the last pieces to bring this all together. So completing the RAG loop is what Chris is gonna show next. Chris, back to you. Now that we have a retriever done, uh, we need to set up our LLM and our LLM needs to be able to do cool stuff. The idea of our LLM is we're just going to get documents that are relevant to our query and our query, nothing else, right? So uh, this is a, a very like tricky part of the retrieval augmented generation process is understanding how little the LLM actually does. I mean, to be fair, what it's doing is incredibly impressive and it matters and its quality matters, but the retrieval system is really what's doing the heavy lifting here in order to ensure uh, we're getting relevant context to answer our questions. But we still need an LLM. Uh, we are going to use, as Greg mentioned, a Llama 2. We're going to be using the 13 billion parameter version of Llama 2, which is absolutely huge. Uh, but we're able to run it on less than 15 gigs of GPU RAM because Tim Demers is a boss. So uh, first thing we're going to do is use our Hugging Face uh, notebook login. This is because we're going to be leveraging Meta's version of the model. Meta's version does require that you get access to the weights. Uh, you can do that through Hugging Face or through Meta. The process is very straightforward. Um, if you're not able to get access though, you can use something like New Research or the Blokes uh, fine-tuned versions of Llama 2 and uh, that will be fine. The first thing we want to do in order to make the magic happen is, uh, you know, use Tim Detmer's bits and bytes, and we're going to load our model in 4-bit. Now, uh, we're going to use the NF4 D-type for that 4-bit quantization. This is a nearly information theory, uh, you know, optimized 4-bit uh, uh, quantization storage format. So uh, very efficient, very effective, and loses very little data almost loses as little data as you could. We're also going to quantize our quantization constants. So when we quantize, we get left with these constants and these constants basically give us the information we need to unquantize or dequantize. Uh, but we're gonna go so hard that we're gonna quantize those as well. Um, and then from there, we also need to set our compute D type it's not effective to use our four bit representation to actually do computation with. So what we're gonna do is when we need to compute, we're gonna upcast our NF4 to bfloat16, do the computation and then downcast it back to NF4. This will ripple through the model so that we don't have the entire model in B, uh, bfloat16 at any given time, just a very small section, which is what lets us have all this accuracy and uh, have these, these great results and generations while also storing our model uh, in a four bit representation. We're gonna set some more configs. And then of course we're going to, uh, you know, get our actual model set up and loaded. We're going to use our model ID, trust remote code equal true, pass in that quantization config, and then we're gonna map this using auto, thanks accelerate. Uh, and then we can call dot eval, just give a, give a look at the model. We can see that we've loaded our model with all 40 of these decoder layers. We have our linear four bit um, for all of our actual uh, computation layers. Remember these will be upcast to be float 16 when they're, they're used. And then we have our uh, MLP, which is also in four bit. Uh, so that's different from the base, uh, you know, expectation where we don't want to just quantize or we just are going to quantize some parts of the model. We're going to quantize the whole thing except for things like the layer norms. Once we have that done, we need to set up our tokenizer. Tokenizer is dope. Um, it just, you just load it up. There you go. Let's go. Uh, we don't need to train this so we don't have to do any, you know, adding of, uh, of particular tokens. Once we have our model and tokenizer, 
Langchain uh, is ready to go, but there's one more step. Uh, Langchain uses the Hugging Face pipelines for uh, its its wrapper. So we have to convert our model into a text generation pipeline, which we can do with Transformers pipeline here. We're going to pass our model and tokenizer, set our task equal to text generation. We have to return the full text, just what Langchain expects. We're going to set our temperature to zero. This is a important step. Uh, Higher temperature means more creativity. Uh, you can think of it that way, right? And uh, more creativity means more likely that it's going to hallucinate. So we want to have our temperature equal to zero. So it's more likely to be very extractive and just reference the text that it sees as opposed to getting creative. Uh, max new tokens is just going to help us set um, how much output we have. We don't want a ton of uh, output. Uh, Llama 2 is a fantastic model as we'll see, but it tends to ramble tends to be very verbose and uh, you know limiting how verbose it can be is an effective strategy when it comes to uh, getting quality outputs. Uh, you'll see that we have Xformers warning, but we're not going to train so we don't have to we don't worry about that. Uh, now that we have our hugging face pipeline, it's easy enough to wrap it in the hugging face pipeline LLM uh, from Langchain. So all we have to do is wrap it and our LLM is now ready to rock. We also want to set up our vector store as a retriever. So the last time we looked at our vector store, uh, you'll remember that we actually had to explicitly embed a query or a vector. Uh, this is going to help us wrap it so we can just pass text and then receive documents back. Uh, once we have our vector store as a retriever, so we have a retriever, and we have our LLM, which is our pipeline wrapped in the Hugging Face pipeline, Langchain LLM, uh, we are ready to set up our retrieval QA chain, which is going to take our LLM, our retriever. We're going to use this standard out callback handler, which is just going to be, it's just going to dump all the outputs into our standard out, which is going to let us see it in our code cells. And uh, we are going to return source documents as true. Um, the return source documents as true is important because we want to be able to source our claims uh, so we can see why the model is saying what it's saying and let people uh, who are using our model be more confident in what the actual uh, outputs are, right? So they can fact check it uh, if they want to know why. Why did the model say this? Let's look at uh, some examples now so we can pass some queries. How was Will Ferrell in this movie? We get a uh, result of, based on the reviews, Will Ferrell's character was not well received by some reviewers but then uh, was uh, re received well by others. So overall mixed. Uh, and this is fantastic. I mean, it reflects the reviews very well that, uh, that were sourced and we can see what the reviews are and why it's getting this, uh, this idea. And uh, that's it. So, you know, the, again, this is a Llama 2 model running on 10 uh, ish gigabytes of GPU RAM. Uh, and that's a fantastic result that is grounded in fact. Let's look at another example. Do reviewers consider this movie Kenuff? Um, and, you know, people are uh, mixed, so it's indeterminate whether reviewers consider the movie Kenuff or not. So the idea here is that even though this query is rather poorly formatted and doesn't really, uh, you know, it's not a very well put together question, right? Uh, still, we get a great response uh, that ha that references the actual reviews and what they what they're saying and kind of what their scores are. And I think that's uh, an incredible uh, achievement from the meta team and shows how powerful this system can be even with little hardware. And lastly, we have did these movies explore themes of ex existentialism? One of the interesting parts is, if you remember, we just kind of dumped all these into the same vector store, but we get a specific response. It appears that Oppenheimer explores themes of existentialism, and then it references some reviews, which they talk about existentialist claims, uh, which it says here, common theme in existentialist literature and film. And then uh, someone references that perfect, which suggests that it explores its themes and ideas effectively. And if we look at the sources, we can see, you know, this idea that it's able to dynamically pick out what is the most relevant pieces of context and then parse through those and give an, a response that makes sense, abides the source documents and leverages some existing knowledge the model has, right? Which is these ideas of, you know, what is, 
uh, themes of existentialism. The model has an idea of that and it uses it to effectively answer our questions. So um, with that, I'm going to kick it back to Greg. Um, thanks so much. Ho ho, Chris. Those were some awesome examples. I'd love to see the way that this all came together at the end. Very, very cool uh, to see how we can sort of fact check and get those sources based on even really complex queries, even very, really terribly structured queries. So, you know, in conclusion today, LLMs really, we, we want to make sure that we're able to fact check them. And that's kind of the core idea behind Bragg. Can we build chat with our data systems that are fact checkable? in some way, shape or form. And so this, this way of doing it with RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, is to allow us to interact in a question answering uh, framework or even in a chat framework by augmenting our prompts with the retrieval process. And, you know, we saw that making Llama 2 super usable, you know, there's no, there's nothing stopping you or anybody you know from picking up these open source models and building really amazing things with them. Always make sure you have enough data. And, you know, it seems like Oppenheimer, you know, ChatGBT, I guess, made a good guess. So was it a hallucination? I guess, you know, I'll leave that up to you. But it was giving existentialist vibes. Uh, maybe that was a leading question at the end of the day. So with that, speaking of leading questions, we're here to answer any and all questions that you have related to RAG. Uh, and I'm going to hand it back to Harpreet, invite Chris back on stage, and we'll get going with Q&A. Thank you, everybody. Awesome, man. Great session, man. You guys covered a lot of ground. Uh, just to kind of recap everything we learned, we learned how to build out a RAG system, right? So we had an index system. You guys learned how to load documents, chunk them up, embed the documents, then store the embeddings. You learned how to create the retrieval system where you took the user's query, you embedded the query, and then did a vector search where we're searching for documents that match the query, and then return the relevant documents. And then we fed that to an augment system. So you create an initial prompt, then we augmented the prompt with that retrieved context and sent that augmented prompt to the LLM and then got back the LLM's response. Covered a lot of ground. Uh, so that was awesome. We got some great questions coming in here on Slido. Uh, so keep the questions coming. Uh, first one here is from Anonymous. Is there any way to include custom metadata while chunking data so that we can reduce hallucinations while fetching answers from multiple documents? Yes. Uh, so you can set up whatever metadata you'd like. Uh, you can set up filtration pipelines ahead of your, uh, your retrieval. So say you, uh, you get a request and uh, that request would best be answered by, uh, it, let's say for instance, in this example, right, we have Oppenheimer and Barbie, we could determine which, uh, which movie our query is most relevant to and then filter our vector store based on metadata we inject which is just saying if the film is barbie or oppenheimer and then only consider sources that are relevant to that query so you can do a ton of awesome stuff with metadata you can build uh extremely structured and very even hierarchical uh indexes uh leveraging things like metadata in the lang chain suite of tools i would say uh great place to start those just with some simple filtering uh makes sense and is very powerful second question coming up is uh, in the future do you think llms will be capable of self-identifying their hallucinations or at least provide a probability on how reliable their answer is the identifying part yes the self-identifying part i do not uh i i i I doubt um, the idea being that, you know, it's possible through techniques like self-refine that the we, we know that the, the output becomes more effective or or better in terms of things like uh, tasks that 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 have some measure. So we know if we self-refine uh, an LLM's output in terms of like code complexity or time complexity in some kind of code. Sure. Yes, absolutely. It can get better. But reducing hallucinations is a, another thing entirely. Now, we can use other models to critique the response of our model. We can use models that are tailored designed or specifically custom built to see if this is uh, if this is something that you're just kind of making up 
uh, or if it makes sense with the context, yes, absolutely, that flow can can work. The self part is the is the thing that I I think we're waiting for more robust research on. Greg, anything to, to add there? Well, I would just add that we've got the uh, the Google Colab notebook. We've got a couple of great articles, Chris's favorites that we've put in there on reducing hallucinations in conversations. And I think the sort of, you know, the true rag is a bit beyond um, the, the discussion right now. Um, Chris has some hot takes on rag that you know, if you if you read the papers, we might we might discuss in a future event. Um, but this is a big problem of like, what do you mean by hallucination exactly? And what do you mean by a right answer exactly? And this is this is sort of you start to get into the RAG evaluation best practices. And there are some things coming out that we you know are going to hold future events on uh, new frameworks associated with analyzing RAG to try to assess whether it's quality data or not. But it, the, the jury is, is very much still out on how to guarantee high quality answers to data questions. Yeah, very hard problem. Awesome. Let's jump into another couple of questions. The next two questions are coming from uh, Shubham. Shubham is asking, are there any uh, techniques for multilingual text, uh, any open source models for the same? Uh, I think he means specifically for Indian languages. Heck yeah. Uh, one of the magical parts of embedding models, especially uh, ones that are specifically built for this, is they don't care what language it is at all. They will embed it all the same into the same space with the same semantic relationship. So the, the, the beautiful part of turning everything into numbers is that the numbers don't really have a language, right? They're just numbers that map to some some n dimensional space and that's related to its semantic meaning. So, um, you know, if your input query comes in in uh, whatever language you, you, you want to say, right, like uh, as long as your embedding model understands that language, as long as you are able to get the document to an LLM that can understand that language, you're chilling. So if you say have an input a query that's in, uh, you know, uh, uh, any like, let's just say French, I guess, right? Because I'm Canadian, so you have French. It embeds the query into that that n-dimensional uh, space. It retrieves documents that could be from any number of languages, whatever is most related. And then we could have a pipeline that detects our input language and then asks our LLM to output in that same language. Uh, and all of that is is easily done. Uh, your results are going to vary based on the language, how well your model has been trained on those languages and how well the embeddings model is gonna be trained. But yes, uh, great techniques, use multilingual embedding models and use multilingual LLMs. Uh, you know, things like OpenAI are great with many languages. Um, things like Bloom and BloomZ are also great with many languages. So, uh, but yeah, the, the magic of the retrieval process is that we don't care about the language. As long as our embedding model can embed it to the same space, we're chilling. So yeah. shout out to Shoe Bomb too. Uh, appreciate you joining us for today's event, man. He just did, uh, uh, we just did a podcast together recently. Um, thanks for supporting the community, Shoe Bomb. All right, let's keep it moving. Right on. Now, another question actually from, from Shubham here, uh, this has to do with token size. Uh, so what I've seen is when data sets go into hundreds or thousands of chunks, the model generally runs out of tokens. What do you do about that? Yes. So if what, if what you mean is that the input context gets too long, um, yeah, I mean, that's an engineering problem. The idea is we want to we want to kind of set our retrieval process up so that we're retrieving n number of documents where n uh, times the chunk size does not exceed our uh, input uh, input token limit, so our context window. Uh, if it does, we need to truncate in some way, so set up a truncation pipeline. Uh, but the idea is you want to engineer the system so that with the user's query, you are never going to exceed that 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 context limit, 
And then we need to do a lot better work on the retrieval side of things in that case. So if we say you know that you you want you need you have these longer contexts, you're only going to be able to get two documents, right, to fit into the context with like a uh, let's say a, a maximum uh, user query, which you can just set programmatically, right? They can't enter more than fifteen. Uh, tokens or whatever it is, but not 15 tokens, obviously, but they can't enter more than 200 tokens, right? Then we need to be very particular about what two pieces of context we return. And so we're going to have to do more work on the retrieval side, uh, you know, maybe maybe expand that pipeline, include these hybrid uh, methods, include whatever methods you want to do to to increase uh, the the relevancy of the context you 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 bring back. But these are programmatic limits we have to be aware of them and engineer systems to be aware of them um and that's that's just about it right we, we never want to send a, 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 a prompt to the model and then an error because our prompt is too big and uh unfortunately lm is not going to know that if you don't if you don't set up a pipeline that detects it until you send the context in and then it'll it'll tell you quickly if there's a problem so a lot of good questions coming in here i like this one uh can we claim that rag will never hallucinate? If not, then how do we evaluate them? How correct? How do we evaluate how correct the generated answers are? Wow! If you have the answer to that question, uh, let everybody else know. Uh, no, the, the the idea is uh, no. We could absolutely cannot claim that rag will never hallucinate. Rag will still definitely hallucinate. It is good. It is better. Uh, you know, it, there, there's, there's solid research that says rag hallucinates less than, than not using it. So that's good. A, a lot of that is just the inclusion of the token sequence. If you don't know the answer, say you don't know, right? Like that's, uh, that, that's, that's part of it. Um, how do we generate the correctness or evaluate the correctness is an excellent question. There are frameworks like Ragas, which is like, uh, you know, using another LLM to determine, did you answer this? Like we, like we were talking about for the previous question, you know, is this correct? How correct is it? How truthfully was it answered? And how relevant was your answer to the question? There's all kinds of tricks we can do and frameworks we can we can maybe apply but at the end of the day um the evaluation piece is not completely solved there is no standardized guaranteed approach to this um you you have to be clever and you have to allow uh you know due, due to the kind of probabilistic nature of llms you have to allow wiggle room and uh the moment we allow wiggle room it becomes very difficult to build a solid pipeline that works for every scenario and use case um but i would say that things like ragas uh things like you know if you if you compare the semantic uh similarity to your answer to your generated answer and then the actual context that you looked at they should be fairly similar or at least share similarities strong similarities with one of them and so there's like there's little tricks you can do but at the end of the day the valuation problem is very open and expensive and requires uh, some creativity uh, in order yeah. to, to nail it. Yeah, and you know, I think we asked some interesting questions today that you can put in an interesting context of evaluation. Like, was Will Ferrell good in the movie? It's like, well, what's the correct answer, right? We're looking at reviews and they go from one star to five stars. Who's right? You know what I mean? It's like, uh, there's so many questions that we might ask a system like this that any human that you speak to would, would reasonably say, yeah, there's uh, obviously no correct answer. There's lots of different standpoints. There's lots of different contexts that people are in that they're coming from, that they're watching this movie. And so, you know, what, what is correct? What in sort of an absolute truth perspective, you know, you start to get a, a bit, a bit philosophical there. It's like, well, there is no truly correct answer. So I think what you end up doing today is you end up building these systems and you end up, you know, using some of the words Chris just used and, you know, using frameworks like Ragus and making sure that, you know, people who want a number that are looking at these systems, whether it's your boss or your startup advisor or your venture capitalist firm, if you're needing to show that there is a correctness going on with your system, you can show that with numbers. But for each use case, if you actually want to make it answer the question the same way a human in your company or your context would, 
what you should do is you should, you know, assess the exact question. Your each piece of the puzzle that you're putting together, the context that you're gathering from all the data that you have access to. And then you should understand how that feeds into your final correct answer. And then you should try to replicate that with the system. And then you should ask, well, how close is it based on you know exactly what I'm looking for? And you can add all these numbers to it, but the numbers are only gonna make sort of external stakeholders that don't really understand the problem happy. What you wanna do is you wanna be the best at understanding the problem. And you might need to come up with some custom ways of counting words and looking for specific, you know, very detailed natural language processing, customized things at the end. Um, but, you know, I think overall, our overarching opinion is that in each industry, there's going to be a core set of problems people are using RAG to solve. And in each industry, there's going to be a slightly different hybrid type pipeline that's going to allow us to get the right context to provide an accurate, quote unquote, accurate answer to those problems. And if you can build the thing that provides a correct solution to that problem, like a truly correct solution to that set of problems, I mean, that's a product that you can sell to every single company within any given industry. And, you know, you better believe people are working on this today. Nobody cares more about this than Amazon and the big cloud providers. So, you know, be a, be a startup and try to get this right. You know, there could be a huge, huge opportunity space for you solving just one problem, but not the meta problem of all rags and all correct answers. Really got a bunch of great questions coming in. Yeah, got a bunch of great questions coming in. Are you guys good to stay a couple minutes past the hour or should we blast through these as quickly as possible? Cool. Uh, so a couple questions here, I'll just, I'll, we'll address them right now. Uh, Money is asking, will we share the links in the videos? Well, if you're watching the video on YouTube, that means you have access to it forever on YouTube. Go back and watch it. There are links to the notebooks in the chat. We'll drop them again right now so you can have a link to that notebook. Money's also ask, asking, do you have a group or team that we can collaborate to further our learnings? There's two communities you can join. Chris is an active member in both of them. One of them is a deep learning daily community, a uh, thousand members strong. We host events like this all the time, not necessarily with, with these guys, um, but we host events like this all the time. And there's also the AI Makerspace Discord community. So we'll drop links to, uh, to uh, both those. I'm sorry, the AI Makerspace is actually a course that you can check out, uh, but feel free to join the deep learning daily community. We do all sorts of uh, collaborations, things like that. Uh, hopefully I can bring these guys on for another session like this. This would be great. Uh, that being said, let's move on to the next question here. In the case that the retriever does not return any documents, does the LLM just not respond? Can we use the system prompts in this case to minimize hallucinations? Yes. Uh, so basically, I mean, there's two ways you can think of this. Uh, you could build a system prompt that said hey we if you don't have any context say you don't know and then we could hope that the llm says it doesn't know or we could build a check that says if the retriever doesn't like this is programming so you know you just just got to program it if no context say you don't know right then then you don't know boom uh but yes absolutely the other way you can think of it is that if it's only going to return irrelevant context, right? Then say you don't know. I think that's a that's a more that's a more difficult problem to solve, and you can solve it not exactly, of course, but you can try to solve it with this process of um, you know doing this. If you don't have relevant context, then you don't know. The other way is to use that kind of reverse pipeline we talk about where we actually have the LLM answer the question and then check and see if the answer is relevant to the provided documentation. And if it's not relevant uh, to the documentation, which we can just check with uh, with like a, a threshold in, in Python or, or JS, whatever you're using Langchain in, then uh, then reject the answer and say you don't know. So there's there's a couple different ways you can, you can, you can work around that. But if it doesn't return anything, I would just programmatically check that and then uh, exit out of the, we never go to the LLM in that case. Question about the chunks. Uh, Jinkia is asking, is it possible to see the chunks that were generated? Uh, and then what happens if a chunk is less than a thousand characters? Is that considered to be an incomplete review? 
Oh, excellent. Yes, we can see the chunks that are generated. Uh, we just have to print out our documents. So after we chunk, we can look at all of our chunks. Uh, we can query the vector store by ID or just print out all of the uh, things we have in our vector store, which will include the text chunks. Um, it, it, less than a thousand characters doesn't have a special significant uh, significance unless you you assign it one through metadata. It uh, does not mean it's an incomplete review, but it it might mean that it's only part of, re of a review. The way that we could do that uh, smarter would be to by review set metadata. Say this review uh, this this review is from this source. This review is from this source. We do that in this example when we have that source. Uh, source metadata so we can check well these three reviews are from the same source so they count as the same review uh, but we still want to chunk them to know you know so we don't ha overwhelm the llm but yeah it's a it's a great question uh it doesn't have significance out of the box you can make it have significance and it's up to you and understanding your data to know if if it does have significance or not What's the fine line between deciding to fine tune or use RAG? Okay. How many fine lines? How many fine lines do you want to talk about? Yeah, I think this is a big question. Um, Chris, maybe give it a minute or two. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll just give like the cool you know, note version. Right now, yeah. Oftentimes, what this question means is, I want to teach my model stuff. I want I, my model doesn't know anything about basketball and I want it to know a lot about basketball, or my model doesn't know about anything that happened in, in, uh, in physics after uh, you know 2021, whatever the cutoff date is for whatever model you're using. And I want it to know that stuff. And the, the, the answer here becomes, we don't want to fine tune to teach our model new knowledge. Uh, we can use continue to pre-train. There's uh, lots of pipelines that we can use to teach our model new things, new knowledge. Um, but if we are looking to teach our model new knowledge, oftentimes the best way to get it to understand new things is to use RAG first. It is cheaper, it is more effective, and it takes way less engineering hours to get set up uh, while offering much better results on the dollar. So I would say... If you're, if this question is related to teaching model new information, I, I would almost say rag a hundred percent of the time. Um, if this question is related to, I want my outputs to be a specific format, or I need my model to interact with a specific API or a specific function or a specific piece of my infrastructure, fine tuning is a great choice. Uh, but you would still use a rag. You would just fine tune the outputs of your rag pipeline. Yeah. And I think the evolving strategy is, you know, you do one shot, two shot, few shot prompting. Can you get the prompt and the context right? That's the question. Then you might pick up RAG to say, well, can you look at other stuff and help me with the context? And then if you really dial in the way you want people to be interacting with your application, if you can get it down to a core set of, you know, questions people are asking or things that they're asking the model to generate, then you're sort of getting specific enough that you might want to try some fine tuning of that structure of the input output schema of the model. And I think this is sort of the generally agreed upon practices now. So prompt engineering one, rag two, then maybe fine tuning. So I guess that's one line we can draw. There's a couple of questions coming in here about vector databases. I'm going to try to combine them all into one question. Um, based on kind of what the gist of the question is. Uh, what does a chunk represent in the vector database and what influence does the embedding model you use have on the uh, embedded chunk that goes in to the vector database? Yes. In the vector database, each chunk has two core components and a bunch of other stuff. And this is not always generally true across all vector databases. So I just want to say, but the idea, the core idea is that the, the vector database is going to contain text and then the vector representation of that text so that we can compare our input query to all of the vectors in our vector database and that's it. 
the idea here is that that vector database, we can add stuff to it, metadata, all this other, but, but you know, not worrying about that for a second. It's just the text representation and the vector representation. That's the core idea of the, of the vector database. Our chunks don't influence the size of vectors. That's our embedding model. Our chunks, uh, you know, the size can influence how many we obviously, if we have a thousand document, we use chunk size, a thousand, we have one, if we use chunk size, 100, we have, uh, 10, right. The idea is there, but, uh, the actual size of the vector is determined by the embedding model. And then the vector database houses the vector and the text. And I hope, hopefully that answers the, the question. I mean, I would just add like, you can go back to like the letter and word and sentence and then everything sort of level embeddings from classic NLP. And if you just sort of think about it at that level, like how would you translate those to simple vectors? That's the way to sort of start thinking about this bottom up. But all of the embedding models today are, are much more sophisticated and complex. There's a lot going on there. So thinking from it from natural language first principles is probably the best way to start. You know, can you do a vector similarity calculation on paper with a simple sentence or word level embedding and then sort of start to look into the embeddings from there and you can get a lot of insight into chunking and the black art that is picking chunk size and a last question here uh, so many good questions uh, so hard to, to to choose but i like this one i think it fits in well with what we're talking about here is there a way to add authority to, uh, in this case, we're talking about reviews of movies. Is there a way to add authority, authority to the reviews in the retriever? For example, a known film critic gets more weight than, you know, a casual movie goer. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you can, you can scale it by some, uh, scale value between zero and one based on some authority score. So you can say the relevancy is higher if it's from a, uh, someone better, or you can, you can build a second pipeline in which you have like preferred through metadata. So you say like preferred reviewer, and then in your prompt that you send the LM, you can say, say, uh, you know, uh, consider the review of a preferred reviewer over the, the, you know, a standard reviewer, blah, 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 blah. Um, the, the idea here being that yes, you can, uh, the solution is up to you and there are many ways that you could approach it. But I would say, yeah, for sure. Uh, the the easiest way I would think is just to change your prompt and add like a preferred reviewer and explain to the model what it is you're trying to do. Or, or maybe just not even include awesome. unpreferred yeah. reviewers in the data in the first place, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, people are asking information about the communities you can join. There's the Deep Learning Daily community for all things deep learning. There's the LLM Ops community where we just talk about LLM Ops. But then there's the AI Makerspace course, which is absolutely amazing. I'm a student of it. Uh, I've learned a lot in this boot camp and cohort. I'm going to drop off and let Greg talk more about that. Thank you all for joining and we'll be in touch. Peace. Yeah. Thank you, Harpreet. Yeah. We, we have just sort of finishing up our first cohort of which Harpreet is part. And we have learned so much in this first cohort about what exactly is the most relevant today, you know, whether it's rag evaluation or whether it's, you know, looking much more deeply into embeddings. There's a lot of things that we've added and we've retooled from cohort one into cohort two. We're really excited to launch this new syllabus and this new detailed schedule coming very soon. And so if you're interested in joining cohort two that starts on September 19th, this is going to be the tip of the spear LLM ops, then please apply today. There are a very limited number of seats and it is quite tough to, to get into this course right now. Um, we're very excited to do stuff like you saw today and to go much, much deeper on tools like Llama Index, on tools like that will allow you to not only build out these systems, but also provide a user interface for them and then serve them at scale. So looking forward to seeing you guys in there. And please don't forget, give a follow to AI Makerspace on LinkedIn and YouTube at AI Makerspace on Twitter to stay up to date on what we're building. And until next time, I know Chris is going to keep building, shipping and sharing. So will the folks in our community. And we look forward to seeing what you build, ship and share next too. Thank you, everybody so much. See you next time.